webcast today is sponsored by Accenture, and we'd like to say a very big thank you to Accenture and let you all know that knowledge is key. But knowledge without insight isn't much of an advantage. Accenture has more than 257,000 people serving clients in more than 120 countries. It's a global management consulting, technology services, and outsourcing company that helps its clients use analytics to, to turn data into insight, into insight, insight into action, and action into tangible results. That's high performance delivered. You can learn more about Accenture, how it helps its clients navigate and harness the power of big data by building big data infrastructures. Folks, today we have Wes McKinney presenting Building Rich High Performance Tools for Practical Data Analysis. Wes gave this talk back in the fall at our Strata Conference in New York, and the talk was so well received and attended that we asked Wes if he could present the event for you all today, and we're really excited to have him with us. It is my pleasure to turn the program over to Wes for his presentation. Hello, Wes. Hi, Yasmina. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the introduction. Introduction, and thanks everyone for for joining up for this webcast. As Yasmina said, I have to give this talk back at the Strata conference um, back in October, which already already feels like a long time ago. Um, and I would describe the talk a little, uh, I guess, as um, more about my philosophy and process for thinking about uh, building data analysis tools and, and some of you know the things that I've learned. Um, along the way in, in my work in building data tools. Uh, so I'll be sharing that with you. So thankful to Accenture for supporting the webcast. Uh, so the structure of the talk, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my background and how I, you know, what I've been working on for the last few years and uh, how I got involved with uh, building data tools and the kinds of things that I think about. Um, so talk about some of the motivations for you know, why to uh, I guess why are we interested in, in the philosophy and the and you know what are the various ingredients uh, that go into um, building data analysis tools and what kinds of problems are we trying to solve? Um, and then I'm going to talk specifically about some of the um, some of the, de you know, the details of uh, you know the technical details that go into building data tools, uh, and I'll show you some some examples that come from um, come from my, my book. So my background is uh, well. I graduated from MIT back in uh, back in '07, and I joined the finance world and worked for HR Capital Management for about three years. And while I was there, I got involved with uh, building data analysis tools for Python and started what would later become the Pandas project. Uh, and over the last two or three years, Pandas has grown into a very successful project, uh, in large part because I've been putting a lot of development work into it. Uh, and now there's a very robust community. Uh, around the project and it's being used very productively in many areas of the industry. Uh, I started out in, in, in finance, but uh, Pandas is very popular uh, in essentially any, any, anywhere that's working, uh, any industry that's working with data, uh, and almost anyone who's using Python is using Pandas, I find. Um, I published a book, which also came out around the time of Last Strata. It's called Python for Data Analysis, and I, designed, I intended for the book to be a very accessible introduction to the modern scientific computing stack. In Python, so those are things like NumPy and IPython and Matplotlib, so it's the core scientific tools in Python. And about 60% you know, of the book or more um, is really a robust and practical introduction to Pandas and looking at um, various important topics in data manipulation and data preparation and showing you how you can use Python to productively integrate into your, your analysis workflows. Um, it's not a treatise on data analysis methods per se, but more about the kinds of tools in Python um, that you can use, that you can start using right away to incorporate into your analysis. So I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, about data tools, and um, I guess this um, working with data and preparing data ends up being you know 80 to even 95 percent of the work that's involved in. Uh, in a data analysis workflow, so you see you know, various estimates from uh, studies uh, people do on, um, on data analysis. And uh, I'm very interested you know, both in the big data and the small data. Uh, in the case of you know, big data, a lot of the analytics that you're doing is just 
um, taking very, very large data and reducing it to, uh, to a small or a medium size so that you can uh, reshape and um, reshape and slice and dice and create models. So a lot of the modeling and really agile data work happens at what I would call the small and medium data level. And you know, typically big data tools, um, there, are, there is a lot of you know, big, you know, big data machine learning and big data analytics. Um, a lot, of, a lot of big data infrastructure is geared around reducing enormous data sets into a manageable form that can be, uh, that can be visualized and sliced and diced and modeled on. Um, so you know, we like to joke in the, in the data community that uh, big data is largely about counting things. I think Hillary Mason has uh, said that in a, in a talk, and I like to, always like to, to use, that, um, I use that saying. So, so really we're talking about uh, Simplifying data wrangling. So when I say data wrangling, I'm talking about all of the um, the work that you need to do to take a raw data set, which comes in in a CSV file or comes out of uh, a database or a series of database tables or a series of CSV files, um, and all of the work that you need to do to um, to integrate that data together uh, to clean up data that's not in the form that you need or contain um, uh, data that's unclean or I need some regularization or processing. So kind of all of the tools along along that pipeline and I've been focused on um, you know, identifying what are the, the key key features um, and things that uh, the trip up users and and slow down your, your data analysis um, your data analysis process. So this really ends up coming down to uh, a lot of user interface design. So data tools, I, I like to think about as being the intersection of computer science, which is the you know the algorithms and um, you know the underlying data processing code, which actually um, crunches the data and reshapes it and moves it around. Um, but the bigger part of that is how you interact with that code and what you know what are what are the sequences what's the sequence of commands that uh, you type into um, type into the terminal or you type into your text editor um, to describe the operations that um, that you're doing with the data. So it's more about um, through human computer interaction and user interface design uh, as much as as much as just the, the underlying algorithms and doing things very fast and efficiently and in a scalable manner. Um, so you know, often when you, you sit down and you're working with a data set, you, you uh, especially when you're working with an unfamiliar tool set. Um, thinking about you know, how all of the pieces fit together and how to efficiently iterate from, from point A to point B um, in an analysis process. So of course there, there, are, there are costs to, to making mistakes and, and you know, user interface design. So I always uh, I, I like this uh, you know, sort of big, big data joke that in big data, you know, if you, if you make, a, make a coding error, it can end up costing you a great deal. I think that's less, uh, less uh, important than small and medium data where uh, if you enter the wrong command, you only have to wait a few seconds uh, to see that it's the wrong, um, wrong command. But I think the same kinds of uh, design, uh, design considerations um, are, are very important in, in big data tools and small data tools. So, uh, very concretely, and you know, what that comes down to is uh, is API design, and so um, so there's lots of things to consider in, in API design. Uh, kind of you know, a couple of things that you hear about is that, uh, especially in the Python world, we like to say that uh, you know it's a good API if it if, if it fits your brain. So that you know the function that you write and function calls that you write and um, the parameters that you pass into them. Um, it's a sign of, uh, I think uh, Uncle Bob Martin says that, you know, a sign of good, clean code uh, is if it pretty much looks like you expect it to. Um, and so I, I like to, you know, you know that you've designed uh, a good tool if, um, if people don't complain about it and it sort of seems like common sense and it's, it's, uh, it's just how you think about, think about the problem. Of course, there's also a risk with API design. Uh, and especially in cases where you might have a very general tool with many different options, and you end up in uh, what I would call a parameter a parameter soup or a parameter health, where you know there's very general things you're doing with the data set, and you might have you know, 12 different knobs that you can turn, uh, and that can also be very overwhelming when you're uh, just trying to get some just trying to get some work done. 
so there's another side of this that you know, syntax uh, syntax matters, um, and there's a there's a cost to um, sort of a mental cost in, in looking at code and uh, especially code that other people have written and, and parsing sort of mentally parsing what what the code does uh, and visualizing, especially in, in the course of working with data, uh, visualizing the the data operation um, and uh, sort of how everything works. You can definitely recognize um, sort of bad syntax. This, these are kind of two very extreme examples. Um, each of these lines is an implementation of quicksort, so this quicksort algorithm. Um, so this is a bit, you know, cherry picking, and uh, um, fans of fans of APL languages might might complain at me. But the, the top one is in the J language, and the the bottom one is in the K language, which are both both modern implementations of um, the array programming language APL from the uh, from from the uh, from the 80s and 90s. I guess said really 70s. In fact, um, there's even more you know esoteric languages where where you can implement things where the code you know just stops making any sense at all. Um, I guess you can fill in you know what the the stars are here. This is a real programming language, but it's largely invented as a completely esoteric programming language. So there's definitely a lot of distance. Uh, you know. You can go far off in the in the extreme of uh, very esoteric, difficult to program languages. I certainly don't program in any of these. Um, and you know, I, I love this quote from Guido Van Rosa, who is the inventor of Python, that the user interface can only can handle only so much complexity, uh, or it becomes unusable. Uh, so focusing on building uh, simple tools versus complex tools, uh, I think is is generally um, a common sense way to do it. Um, now, of course, there are you know folks among us who who like uh, very complex, um, precise tools, um, but there I think there is is a, a place in between. So, in terms of actually uh, implementing data tools, if you were starting on a, a blank slate and and building yourself a set of uh, practical uh, data analysis tools. Um, there's the you know API and uh, sort of the user interface side of things of uh, how you the user you know what's the code going to look like that you'll write uh, to do analysis with the tool that you built um, and then there's you know how you actually implement it and that comes down to uh, representing um, the underlying data types whether you have you know strings or booleans or uh, or dates or you know, other kinds of um, other kinds of data. Um, often, those you're working your one of your primitive uh, types is an array, so you have a sequence of uh, essentially multi-dimensional sequence of those data types. Um, data structures also fit into fit into that, especially uh, for writing for writing algorithms. And the algorithms part of things is how um, you know you must be carefully thought about to make everything fast. So. In terms of arrays, um, I guess nowadays a lot of us are programming in R and Python and uh, MATLAB, and we don't think, think too much about arrays. We say, okay, I've got um, you know a bunch of data in a data frame or a, um, a table-like object. We don't think about too much about um, the underlying array representation. Uh, so array programming started back in the uh, back in the 70s and 80s with Fortran and Fortran and ACL, and the modern languages are uh, a lot of us are programming in R and Python and MATLAB and, uh, and other languages. So these are so when I say array, I mean it. All all of the elements in the array have the same type and it can be of arbitrary dimension. So you could have you know five or six dimensional arrays if you really wanted to. But more often than not, we're working with one or two dimensional arrays. And you can think about scalar values as being an array that doesn't have any dimensions. Uh, it's zero dimensional. And arrays are important. Um, for expressing batch operations on data. So um, when you take a column in a spreadsheet or a column in a table, um, like to be able to express batch operations on a set of related data points, and that saves you from having to um, to write a lot of loops and end up with very robust code that, uh, that involves iterating over, unnecessarily iterating over the data set. Um, arrays are also important when you are uh, slicing and dicing a very large data set and that you can um, you can just look at a subset of a table or a subset of an array um, as, as a view. So, um, so 
So array data, proper array data structures enable you to look at, if you just want to look at, say, the first 100,000 rows in a table, um, you can construct a view of an array and express your, your data operations on that view without having to copy any data. Um, so if you, you know, familiar with, if you're deeply familiar with, you know, R or Python or MATLAB, um, there are various places where a lot of data gets copied and that can be a source of slowness in your application. Um, of course, you know, uh, most of you are probably familiar with uh, the data types they're working with. There's um, the low-level, you know, uh, numeric data types and strings and dates and times. Um, depending on the language that you're working with, you can also have arrays of arbitrary objects. You can have arrays of arrays or uh, arrays of pairs of dates and strings. And um, so you can have um, somewhat arbitrary complexity and uh, representation of um, representation of the data. Um, there are a couple of other uh, data types that I would add to this list. So, um, so one of them is a, is a categorical variable. So um, in R, the uh, main is a factor. Um, so if you, can, you can take, for many of your base data types, you can compute um, a categorical variable, uh, which is a, um, which is a, a, I guess, or another name for it is enumeration. So if you know that you only have a, a fixed set of distinct values that occurs in an array, um, you can endow it with special properties such as ordering or, um, or, or you can have a more compact representation of that data. And that will help you a lot more on down the road when you're doing, when you're slicing and dicing or uh, aggregating the data. You can take advantage of that special structure that you know that you only have a fixed set of categories of the data. Um, you can also compute arbitrary uh, structures of these, of these data. So um, things like uh, tuples, you might have a tuple of an integer and a string and a date, uh, and that uh, could be defined as a record or structure data type. Uh, on top of all of this, and, and uh, if you've ever you know, spent a lot of time implementing data tools, that uh, in in reality, and I guess in real world data, uh, I find that most data sets that I encounter have missing values, and uh, those might be um, you are parsing a CSV file and you come to a row where there's just no values for certain entries um, in a row, and so you need to be able to encode that and represent it in the data. Uh, and, and, and represent it in the data structure and have a way to, to fill missing values, to drop missing values, um, to have a core set of, of operations that um, can take into account the, the missingness of data. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are, there are problems with all of this uh, data type business that you can end up with, uh, you know, I guess I'd say stuck in type two. Um, where, you know, the, among integers and floating point numbers, there are different kinds of, uh, different kinds of integers, different kinds of floating point numbers. You can represent, you know, complex and real numbers. Um, there are different kinds of strings. Um, so this can, things can get very complex very fast if you aren't careful. Um, and to make matters worse, when you're actually implementing um, the algorithms underlying the, these things, um, there's many different ways that you can represent the data at the machine level, um, but you don't want the user to have to think about all of this. So you don't want to, them, you know, you know, the person who's writing code, you don't want them to have to worry about whether uh, you have a 16-bit unsigned integer or a signed 32-bit integer. Um, it represents a quantity, and we can do numerical operations on it. And that's you know, really the only thing that matters. Um, but of course, you know, for someone who's implementing these things, uh, you do have to think about it because there is memory use considerations and performance considerations. Uh, so it is uh, a necessary evil in some cases, but I think that it should be it should be hidden from the end user uh, to the extent possible. So on top of arrays and our basic data types, I, you know, the way I uh, find myself usually working with data in table form. Uh, so here I've got a drawing of what is uh, sort of a more generalized table. So if you think of a table as just being a list of arrays, um, and each array has a fixed data type. So we can have uh, one of the arrays can be an integer, another can be Boolean, another can be strings. Um, 
a common simplification is that the table only contains one-dimensional arrays. So if you're an R programmer and you use data frames, data frame is a table that contains all one-dimensional arrays. Uh, but you can, in some other areas, in some other applications like metrics, it's very common to work with um, panels, which are tables containing two-dimensional arrays. Um, you can also think about a panel as being a three-dimensional array. All of the data have the same type. Um, you can add an additional layer of, um, of metadata on top of the table by adding um, row and column labels. So in this, in this example, uh, the column labels are just integers, but we could also have some um, information about what each row in the table represents. So here I put a simple two two level level index, which turns this table into what would look like a pivot table in in Excel, or uh, if you have another tool that builds pivot tables. Um, so you can have a data structure which represents um, arbitrarily many uh, layers of labeling. So here we just have two levels. Um, where the first four rows are the A level or the A group, um, and the first level of the of the row, of the row labels, and the second level just has the integers one, two, three, four. So here's a, a uh, sort of a real example from from Pandas of a uh, of a table that has uh, both hierarchical um, row labels and hierarchical column labels. So if we we look at the raw data, um, these are some some aggregated uh, Tip data, and you can see that um, in the in the columns we have days, and then we have aggregate statistics, and in the rows uh, we have the time and smoker variables. And if you define your data structure with uh, in this very general way as a sequence as a sequence of arrays um, with arbitrary column and row labels, then having this more complex uh, this more complex Data structure, which represents pretty high-dimensional data. Here we've got four layers of labeling. Uh, you can represent it in a tabular format that's very can be very nice to work with. Um, you could also have represented this data in more of a traditional flat uh, spreadsheet-like form that, that could be loaded into a relational database. Uh, and this is also, you know, valid way of, of storing this data. Um, but this um, Pivoted hierarchical, uh, pivoted format, uh, it can also be very nice to work with depending on your application. Now, of course, you can have all of these very complex data structures, but you need to have uh, very, very simple code to express operations on them. Um, so there's a big set of uh, big set of data operations that you can um, that you can use on uh, on tabular data sets, and I'll, I'll talk about um, a couple of them, so this is kind of an exhaustive, uh, an exhaustive list um, you can do with tables. Um, so let's just look at a simple example of table concatenation. So on the left side here, I have a set of um, stock price data over a set of uh, over a set of dates, and on the right, some stock volume data, and Something that you might want to do is to join together these two data sets into a single table and to still, to still be able to distinguish the price data from the volume data and refer to, you know, Apple's price or Johnson and Johnson's volume. Um, and we have the additional uh, complexity that the row labels of the tables are different. Uh, so also, we also need to introduce some missing data into the into the right. Table uh, because it doesn't have any data on the 13th or 14th of September. So if you were using uh, the pandas library, you could express this operation with uh, with the functions concat. And I pass a list of the left and the right tables, and I'm concatenating along axis one, which is the columns. Axis zero is the rows, and, I, and then I have this keys argument here, um, which says that I want to uh, to add an additional uh, level in the columns uh, to be able to refer to the piece to the two tables uh, that are being joined together here, and so we end up with this single table, which now has column labels consisting of um, price, price and volume as the first level, and, and um, the stock tickers as the second level, um, and so now we can refer uh, in, a, in a simple way to any individual data point. 
um, by either price and volume, stock ticker, and date. And in the bottom right corner, you can see that it's introduced um, um, not a number as missing value, missing value indicators in the table. So here's another example of a, a, a primitive table operation. So going, looking back at this um, joins table of this price and volume data, something I might want to do is to, to do a reshape operation where I pivot down the um, price volume level into the rows. So now I have one column for each stock um, and then two levels of row labeling. So, so if you were using pandas, you could type, um, I called this, this variable result and I call result stack zero, which says take the top level of the columns and rotate that down into the rows. And that does um, computes now. There's two levels of row labeling on the table. I see a flashing Q&A uh, tab, but it's nothing coming up. So to actually implement these things is not not entirely straightforward, but uh, the you know at the end of the day it comes down to uh, array operations and moving data around in an efficient way. Um, and in a lot of cases, there's um, one of the most important sets of algorithms uh, for for processing data has to do with set logic, and um, and that usually involves the use of hash tables and sets. Um, and the other class of extremely important algorithms is sorting. Uh, and that, you know, it, I would say that those two, those two things, hashing and sorting, um, it, as far as implementing data tools, are, are two of the most important things that I, I utilize on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another very important area of data analysis is doing group operations. And there's this fantastic paper by Hadley Wickham. And so, if you don't know Hadley, he's an author of of many um, widely used R packages, in particular ggplot2 for visualization and uh, the reshape2 and flyer packages. Um, and I, I love talking to Hadley because the, uh, so I developed pandas uh, essentially without looking at Hadley's libraries. And uh, it's interesting to see how we've developed uh, some of the same um, design decisions and also some different design decisions. And looking at each of those uh, design choices, you can certainly, um, you know, uh, I, you know, decisions that have been made, um, often I'll say, okay, well, that, that's a better way of doing things. And then you know, we might disagree over uh, some other uh, particular design choice that I made in Pandas or that he made in, made in Fire. So a lot of people are doing group operations by writing SQL. So I put a, a simple uh, SQL statement here where we grouped by three keys and aggregated um, computed the means of one column and the standard deviation of another. And this is a very general class of data operations that goes far beyond databases. Um, it's just a sort of a, you know, general way of slicing and dicing tabular data. So in, in, uh, in Pandas land, um, sort of the way I think about um, grouping and aggregation is in two different steps. So first you have a table grouped by a set of keys. So the keys could be any number of things. So often there'll be just column names in the table that you want to use to group it. Uh, you might have data that falls, that, that, came, that came from outside the table or maybe is being derived from data that's in the table. Um, and so you could have arbitrary arrays that you use to group the table. Um, or you might have some complex logic which is um, expressed in a function and the function can get applied um, to each row of the table to determine which, ro which uh, group each row belongs to. So once you've described how you want to group the table, which, you know, in the case of uh, an SQL state, it will just be a list of column names, you want to apply uh, a function to it or a set of functions uh, to the columns, and that might be something so simple as uh, you want to compute the mean of one column and the standard deviation of another column, um, but there's more complex operations that you can do that, that, that you can do, um, more complex operations that you can do, also do. Um, and so we would hope that um, depending on the form of the function or the form of the, the aggregation that we get something useful back that we can 
uh, that we can work with nicely. So this is, I guess, a, a visual representation of how a, how a group buy works. So you have um, a, an array of data and an array of, of group indicators or group, group labels. Um, so we split the data into pieces and we apply a function, uh, which in this case, in this case this uh, picture is just a simple aggregation. And then we combine that together into a final result table or labeled array. Uh, so here's a more complex operation where I took a, um, and you probably can't I don't know if you can read the, the table, it's very small on my screen, um, where we group the table by a column. And then instead of aggregating, I want to, uh, to take each group of data, sort by uh, sort by the values in a particular column, and then select the highest two values in the in the in out of each group. So if we have the raw table on the left, I grouped by the, the size column, and then I select the top two. Um, and then the result that we get is a table that is now is labeled by size. So in this data set, there were only six um, six values of size. And then for each size, there are two, two rows that were retrieved from the table. Um, so here's another example where uh, instead of grouping by size, we want to first discretize size into two groups, into 0 to 3 and 3 to 6, and then group by the, those discrete buckets, and then select out the top, uh, well, here, four, four values in this case. So rather than saying, okay, I want to group by the size column in the table, I'm going to first uh, discretize the, the size column with the pandas cut function. And I say, okay, I want to divide into 0 to 3 and 3 to 6. And then I'm going to group by my discretized um, size array and then apply my top end function and select the top four values from each group. And in doing so, I get back now a table that it now has two groups, 0 to 3 and 3 to 6, and for the top four values for each of those buckets. So what's going on inside group by? Um, for, I don't know if you've ever, uh, ever thought about this, um, but the first thing that you have to do is identify uh, which, uh, which group each row in the table belongs to. Uh, and that typically involves taking a column of data, converting it to a categorical variable, which um, enumerates the groups and gives you a nice labeling. If you have multiple, um, if you have multiple, uh, multiple key arrays or multiple key columns, um, the algorithm is a little more complicated. You have to form tuples out of those values and compute a categorical variable off of those tuples so that you get all of the unique combinations in the keys. Um, and then you can either um, apply, you can either aggregate the data by doing a scan of the, of the whole table. Um, but for more complicated, uh, more complicated analysis, you may need to sort the data um, into contiguous groups and then go through each chunk of the table and apply the function to it. So kind of the gory details of what's going inside, what's going on inside um, these ICE data algorithms if you're uh, more visually curious. And you can get extra performance wins by uh, by saving um, saving pre-computed values. Let's say you pre-compute uh, the categorical variables, and that's a lot of the a lot of the work that is to be done in a lot of cases. So you get things to be fast, and from all number of things, and you have to uh, to make all of the, balance all of these considerations and evaluate depending on your use case um, how to make things make things really fast. Um, choosing the best algorithm, I guess, is, I would say is the, the most important thing. Um, but there are other kinds of considerations, like how your uh, data is laid out in memory, whether in row-oriented fashion or column-oriented fashion. Um, if you're using an interpreted language like, like Python, you also have to worry about um, the, uh, the overhead associated with uh, dynamic typing. So you have you know, little boxes. You can think of them as wrapping your underlying data. Um, so if you're doing a lot of um, data manipulation of, of box data, um, there might be more overhead, at, overhead associated with boxing and unboxing the data than actually doing the computation. Um, 
So in the case of libraries like, like Pandas, the, the actual uh, heavy lifting is being done uh, at a lower level and not, not in the interpreted language. So just to, you know, also, you know, give you a, a fun example to show that, that not all uh, not all algorithm implementations are, are created equal. Um, you could ha all have several implementations of the same algorithm, and one might be a lot faster than the other just because of um, how the code is written. So I took a, a very very simple function that gets used uh, all over the place to computing. Um, you have an array, and you want to compute the unique values that are found in that array. Uh, and you know, this function is found in basically every data analysis language. And I use the test case of generating a big set of, of a million integers that only have um, 10,000 unique values. This should be values instead of views. Um, so I uh, so I ran the unique function in R and in NumPy and in Pandas and also in Julia. Um, I was playing around, uh, playing around a lot with with Julia uh, back in October, and I was curious uh, about, about this part of it, part of thing. Um, and so everybody's implementing the same algorithm um, to compute the unique values, and you can see the performance is quite a bit different. Um, I also noted that the J, uh, the J array language is able to do this um, almost an order of magnitude faster than the other languages. After I gave this talk, I actually dug down into the J source code to see what's going on. It turns out I, I was a bit sad when I when the, when I found out why it's a lot faster. And it turns out that there's an even better algorithm for computing um, unique values of integer arrays when the when the range is small. So if you look at the values first and see that um, the values all fall within let's say zero to ten thousand, which I think they did in this case, um, then you can use a, a a simpler algorithm that just does a uh, a sweep and count and doesn't have to use a uh, use a count uh, sort of a I don't know what the word would be counting sort. Uh, it doesn't require using a full blown hash table. Okay, so I am going to uh, go to a slightly interactive portion of the web chat and see if I can share my screen. So let's try this. So I'm just going to run through some some quick examples, and and these are um, this is a, a data set um, that's found um, that I use in my in my book. Um, it's from the um, USDA, and it's a a data set that contains um, nutrient information about a about six thousand six thousand foods, and I've seen uh, a number of different analyses and visualization involving this data set recently on, on the internet. Um, so basically the data is in is in JSON, so I'm I'm loading loading in the data. So if you're interested in you know web visualization, you end up having to work in JSON most of the time. Uh, so I'm loading the data into Python with the um, JSON load function. And that gives me a list of um, what represent JavaScript objects and each object is a um, you can see is, is a Python dictionary that contains metadata about a single food. So we have a food name, so we have a caraway cheese, and then a food group, a food ID manufacturer, if there is one known. And for each food, there's a nested list of uh, nutrients. So there's, um, I guess, the, you know, might be 40 or 50 different nutrients for each food. So the, you know, the major nutrient groups like protein and fat um, but also down into the individual um, vitamins and minerals that are found in the food. So if you want to uh, to slice and dice and do some analysis on this data set, you have to do, um, and you also considering that it uh, is 6,600 6, foods in the data set, so it's pretty big. Um, it's not big data, but it's medium data. Um, so we need to do a little bit of work so to wrangle this into shape and then be able to, to slice and dice it a little bit. Um, so if we were just looking, interested in looking at the nutrients for a single food, um, I can just take, uh, let's take the nutrients for this caraway cheese, and that gives me a list of uh, Python dictionaries, which are just little mappings. 
Um, and if I pass the, that list of nutrients to the pandas data frame constructor, that gives me a um, that gives me back a data frame, which is a table of data. And here I call the head function, which gives me the first 10 rows in the data frame. So you can see there's the food description, the food group, the, the units, and the um, the number. Uh, I looked at I, the value here is the uh, amount per 100 grams of food. So if we were just looking at a just looking at a single food, and we wanted to say, okay, well, how many uh, how many uh, nutrients from each uh, nutrient group are there in the data set? We could look at the root column from the data frame, and you call the value counts method, and that returns back a, a labeled a labeled array, which is a Kansas series object. Um, it shows us that there are 54 amino acids, so 42 vitamins, and you can see all the other food groups that are that are there. Um, so we could also uh, group by um, do things like group by uh, group, and then let's say we wanted to compute the mean value by group. We could then select the value column and call the mean method, and then that gives us back um, an array containing. Uh, the food groups and then mean values for each group. So if we wanted to do some more, you know, analysis over all of the um, all the foods, we need to do a bit more work. Um, so just walk you through this very quickly. Uh, I'm not hoping to teach you pandas with this demo, just to kind of illustrate the tools a little bit. So um, so I write out the the metadata that I'm interested in extracting for each food from the database. And so I pass the whole database into the data frame constructor with those keys, and that gives me back. A, a data frame that, uh, with one row for each food and just has the food description group uh, and ID. Um, so I'm going to rename description to food and group to F group. So I have a, I write down a mapping of renaming and then I use the rename function to rename the columns with that mapping. So I get back a new table which has now uh, food, food group, instead of description and group, which is more generic, so here it's more specific. Um, and then I'm going to iterate through each food, take the nutrients for each food, add a, a column that um, is the ID for that food group, so we'll have the same ID in each row of that nutrient data frame. And then I'm going to concatenate together all of those smaller uh, nutrient tables to create uh, one, big, one big nutrient table um, we look at it, it has about 400,000 rows, and um, the number of, if we look at the ID column and compute the unique values of the ID column, we can see that we have 6,636 foods. Um, I also noted that uh, in looking at this data set that there, uh, that there are some duplicate entries in it, uh, which is a pretty common kind of thing, it turns out, in practice, and so we can uh, call the duplicated method, uh, which examines all of the rows in the data set. And when we call duplicated, it gives us back a Boolean array that we can then sum, and that shows us that, in fact, that there are 14,000 uh, duplicate entries in the data set. So it's a pretty unclean data set. Um, so what we can do is take this duplicated Boolean array, put minus in front of it, and say nutrients. So, so we're taking nutrients where the nutrient data is not, not duplicated. So I'll call this nutrients. And so I run that. Yeah, now we have a little smaller data frame. We could also have just used the drop duplicates convenience method. So I, I like to have convenience methods. Um, you could argue that, well, okay, writing out you know, nutrients from, you know, not, not duplicated is, is uh, not that complicated. Um, but I like having, you know, a simple method, especially one that can be you know, tag completed uh, for doing such a common operation as soft duplicates. So I see nothing particularly wrong with that. So, uh, so I'm also going to rename the description and group columns in this nutrient data. Uh, and now we can merge together the, um, the metadata about the food and then the nutrients because we added this ID column. So now we can merge everything together with the pandas merge function. 
So we're merging nutrients with the nutrient metadata on the ID columns, and we're going to do an outer, an outer join between the two tables. Uh, so we get back now a single, single data frame that has, uh, has all of the, the data of interest. Um, so we can do something like compute a cost tabulation of nutrient group and units to see um, how the, so the cost tabulation is just the count. So, uh, so when you see a positive value in this table, it's just the, the number of observations in that table that, that are of that, that pair. So the number of, so it turns out that um, each, um, it turns out that each nutrient group uh, with the exception of, well, I guess there are several that have both, that have multiple, uh, have multiple units, but some of them, like amino acids, is only represented in grams in the data set. So those are um, so if we look at the, I just grabbed the 30, the position 30,000 row from the, from the table, and we can see what an individual row in the, in the table looks like. So we have nutrient, nutrient group, Food and food group and ID and value of units. So then we can uh, we can do um, essentially you know go crazy from here once you know how to use to use Panda. So suppose that we want us to group by nutrient and food group. Let's compute the median values um, for each group in the data. Um, these are uh, median nutrient densities by nutrient and food group. And we could just look at, let's say, zinc, um, and then order by value and make a bar plot. So we chain together all of these operations. You can think about, these might be totally foreign to you, but it's nice to be able to think about each of the data operations. So here we group, we select a column, we compute median, uh, we select the zinc values, we order by value, and then we plot. And so it's nice to be able to chain together these operations in a very natural way. And then we get a plot and we can see that, uh, that the highest concentration of zinc is found in beef products and there's almost none to be found down in fats and oils and beverages, beverages category. So a little bit of a, a, of a vignette of some, uh, some data tools that, that I've been involved with building, but I, I, my general philosophy has been that, um, you know, tries to minimize friction in um, in, in writing code, and the code should be as simple uh, as simple as possible for uh, for representing these data operations. So the uh, so the summary I would say here is that um, you know given that uh, you know there's a shortage of data scientists that we're hearing a lot about, uh, the, the main solution to the data scientists shortage is to make existing data scientists more productive. Um, and when you consider that a lot of the headache involved in data analysis has to do with just cleaning and manipulating and preparing data, uh, we really should be thinking hard about our tools. And um, whenever you, you know, run into a problem where, you know, you're spending a lot of time, you know, doing some manual cleanup in, you know, in Excel or, um, you know, having to, you know, call somebody to help you out with your analysis, um, you think about, you know, how could you know, how could the tools be better? And if you could have that that magical you know one line of code that uh, um, you know, does the thing that you need to do with that data, and it's helpful to kind of write that down and think about it. And you know if uh, you you, don't, you can't find a you know an R package or a Python package or something in Panda that, that does exactly what you need, you know to to reach out into the community and talk to people and and to, to share your your use cases uh, and how uh, sort of the problems that you're encountering with your data. Um, I think the tools that the tools today's tools can certainly be a lot better uh, than they are now, and I'm very excited to see that in the last um, you know, four or five years, there's been a lot of progress to make data data preparation, data manipulation, data analysis tools uh, a lot more productive. And so, you know, Hadley Wickham and the R community uh, has done amazing things to um, to make uh, working with data a lot easier with the reshape to and flyer packages. Um, and I've sort of been Hadley's counterpart in the Python community with, with Pandas. Um, my hope would certainly be that in the future, uh, whenever the future gets here, that 
in any programming language, because uh, you know the programming language that you're using may not totally be up to use. You may not be able to use um, R or may not be able to use Python. But I would hope that every language has a core set of structured and semi-structured data processing tools so that you can you know, be programming in any language and still express operations on the data in a very natural way. Um, and I think the, the common structures and the, and the ways that the, the operations that you need to do on data, um, I think there's a lot of common commonalities that can that can be built um, in, in across all languages and how the API would look, you know, if you're programming in Haskell versus programming in uh, C or Python or R. Um, I think the code may look a bit different, but the, the basic idea is that what you're doing to the data um, is, is going to be very similar from, from place to place. Uh, and I am, I'm continuing to work um, on data tooling, and uh, so that's kind of like in my area of interest. And you know, I need to see um, you know, very, smart, uh, very smart people um, doing data analysis and finding them themselves limited by, by the tool. Um, so I am working on a new, a new project, which I hope to talk about uh, more, this, more this spring, so I, I, I won't uh, share too much about it in, in, the, in the webcast, but uh, I'm actively working to, uh, to, to build better data tools and make, to make uh, data analysis more productive for, for more people. So thanks very much for listening in. Uh, I share my thoughts occasionally on these topics on, on Twitter and there's a very active community of data analysts and data scientists on Twitter. So if you're not on Twitter, I would encourage you to uh, join in on the conversation and uh, to find, you know, the thought leaders in our space, you know, Pete Skomarok and Hillary Mason and, um, you know, Josh Wills and sort of, you know, people who are um, really active in, in spreading um, knowledge and you know, what people are, are doing uh, in, in data science in, in, in these days. So thanks everyone for listening and thanks to uh, thanks to Accenture, our sponsor. I guess yeah, maybe I'll let you uh, take it take it over from here. And as we close the program, we would like to say a very big thank you to Accenture for sponsoring today's webcast and let you all know that knowledge is key. But knowledge without insight isn't much of an advantage. Accenture has more than 257,000 people serving clients in more than 120 countries. I'm going to push out a little link to you all here so you can download their PDF. Um, it's a global management consulting, technology services, and outsourcing company that helps its clients use analytics to turn data into insight, insight into action, and action into tangible results. That's high performance delivered. You can learn more about how Accenture helps its clients navigate and harness the power of big data by building big data infrastructures. And here it comes right there on your site, folks. All right, there's a PDF that they've made available for you, so if you want information, please download that. You can follow up with them there. Thank you, Accenture. Thank you, Wes. Thank you to you all for attending. This will conclude our webcast today. Goodbye, everyone.